visually creative ways, among others. Um, today, we are joined by uh, a dear old friend of mine, Virginia Postrel, author of her new book, The Fabric of Civilization. Um, before I even get into introducing Virginia, I want to encourage and remind all of you, whether you are joining us on Zoom or on Facebook or on YouTube to uh, please bring your questions and type them right into either the chat or into the comment stream. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible, but uh, get them queued up right now. So Virginia uh, is a Bloomberg opinion columnist. She is the author, as I mentioned, of the most uh, recently released Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World, uh, which explores the need for textiles and how it has driven uh, technology, business, politics, and culture. Her previous books include The Power of Glamour, one of my favorites, uh, The Substance of Style, and of course, uh, her classic, The Future and Its Enemies. Virginia served as editor of Reason Magazine, our great friends over there from uh, 1989 to 2000. And she's currently on the board of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, uh, whose uh, CEO we just uh, interviewed, I think last week. Um, Virginia, welcome, welcome again and thank you for joining us. Great to be with you. It's been a while. I miss I miss yes. you. And I miss our get-togethers. I, get I get, miss our yeah. dinner parties. No, you have great dinner parties. <laughs> well, uh, we will have the next one as soon as you get your vaccine. Uh, and you have a, a standing invitation. I would love to do a, a book party for you. Oh, thank you. Here in Malibu. So, um, Virginia, tell us, you know, I know because I've read the book, but it's, uh, you, and you were kind of not exactly facetious, but you were saying, well, I could make this story of how I got interested in textiles. You know, I could talk about my mother slaving away over, uh, you know, a, um, a sewing machine, but it, it really was, it seemed to be more of an interest in um, technology and innovation. Tell, tell us a little bit about that it didn't necessarily come out of the, the previous two two books, uh, which were about no, style. Uh, not directly, no. I mean, there were definitely uh, conferences and academics, uh, scholarship that I was exposed to as offshoots of the research I did for those two books that over time led me to say, wow, there's a lot of interesting stuff here about textile history. But really, in some ways, this is a return to uh, a lot of the interests that drove the future and its enemies, less about politics per se, but more about the human ingenuity, innovation, uh, technology and science, and how that intersects with culture and everyday life. And throughout my work, there is a sort of an impulse toward writing about things that are really important but tend to be overlooked and this is definitely textiles nowadays are one I mean, if we were t having this conversation a hundred years ago that would be much less the case uh, throughout most of human history textiles have been extremely central to human activity whether that was household activity or business activity early industry, uh, early commerce, long distance trade, all of those things, uh, textiles are absolutely central to it. But because it has been so successful the, in the past 100 years, and especially in the, maybe say the past 50 years, we enjoy a tremendous textile abundance and therefore we now suffer from textile amnesia. And I'm trying to sort of cure that amnesia and tell some really fascinating stories along the way. Yeah, your uh, description of the time, the labor, the expense that was required to make, you know, the sales of the Mayflower, for example, is uh, is a really dramatic, I think, reminder of the advancements and the abundance that we have in our lives. Um, looking back through through history, what, what were some were there shifts that made those advances? Possible. I mean, everything from three D printing now to, uh, to to ancient. Right. Well, there, it, the story of textiles sort of illustrates two things, which are explicitly the theme of the chapter on dye, but you can see it elsewhere. 
Uh, one is the power of learning by trial and error when you don't necessarily have an underlying scientific understanding. Uh, people all around the world figured out how to use local plants to make beautiful blues with indigo dye. And if you have ever done indigo dyeing, you can see that it's an incredibly complicated process. And the underlying chemistry is really complicated. Uh, you first have to, you know, combine the plant and water and it makes an enzyme, which then turns into a chemical, which then turns when it's uh, combined with oxygen, produces the indigo color, but that won't actually dye cloth. So then you have to change it to another chemical and then get it to saturate the cloth and then expose it to the air and then it turns blue. It's this incredibly complicated process that wasn't understood wasn't understood at all, even a hint of it, till the 18th century, and wasn't really understood until the 19th century. Um, and yet people all around the world figured it out how to do it, which is amazing and shows just how intelligent people can be and even uh, and how driven also to do more than just functional, to, you know, to make their cloth beautiful, meaningful, uh, all those themes that are in my book, The Substance of Style. That said, it also shows the limits of that kind of trial and error learning. So when you start to have a more fundamental understanding of, first of all, how to do science in a systematic way, and then later you get more theoretical understanding of there are these things that we could now call elements. There are these things that we call compounds. Here's how they interact. Uh, here's how you can change them. That's when you start to get in the 19th century synthetic dyes, which then lead to the entire chemical industry that jump starts the chemical industry, which then gives us things like aspirin and explosives and photographic chemicals and glues and eventually in the 20th century, uh, synthetic fibers and plastics all of which comes from this dye. So we have this intersection that's sort of on the, um, the scientific side of that tacit, long, hard won experimental trial and error knowledge and the understanding that comes when you start to actually get modern science. And then the other theme that's very prominent in the book is that textiles have always been traded goods. They have been uh, fundamental to the development of commercial uh, networks. And because of the needs of those business people going back you know, 4,000 years or more, uh, people have developed, those business people, the entrepreneurs, even in ancient, ancient times, have developed really important institutions like mass literacy, like the use of Arabic numbers and that kind of arithmetic calculation that we learned in elementary school, like mail service, uh, like various financial institutions. So that's a story of that. And that all of this comes together in the late 18th century, where you have the uh, the Industrial Revolution, and that is the first sort of jumping off point. Um, and of course, um, uh, uh, scholars have great arguments about why the Industrial Revolution happened when and where it did, but clearly there are elements of trade being an honored thing, people being able to make money by innovating, science being advanced to a certain point, the mechanical arts being sufficiently respected in society where people would engage in them, they weren't seen as sort of lesser, and also having a consumer marketplace and, and consumers driving this. And I have a whole chapter on consumer and international competition, international uh, trade, e exposure to things like Indian textiles. So this is a contemporary example of a traditional Indian textile that I bought it were very influential. So th there have been leaps. And, and in an article that I wrote before I was writing a book, I sort of identified three major leaps. The first was the Industrial Revolution, which started with spinning machines, which gave us abundant cloth. And then the, later you have power looms. And so the second was the invention of chemical dyes in uh, starting in 1856, which 
revolutionized textiles, but also by seeding the entire chemical industry revolutionized the world. And the third was the invention of synthetic fibers in, in the 1930s. So those are the three big leaps. And then nowadays we have a lot of incremental improvements. So they're not flashy, they're not glamorous, uh, but they, if you compare uh, the kind of outerwear that's available today to what would have been available even 30 years ago, it's much, much superior. And now a lot of people who are um, innovating in other areas, particularly in science, look at textiles as a way of getting a lot of bang for the buck, that they, if they can take the things that they're learning and apply them to textiles because they're so ubiquitous, you can really change the world. You know, it's it's interesting what you're, um, and by the way, I want to remind all of you who are just joining us, just tuning in on Zoom, on YouTube, on Facebook, we are here with Virginia Postrel talking about her fabulous uh, new book, The Fabric of Civilization. We are talking textiles, we are talking um, innovation, uh, how these cultural shifts let, made certain uh, industrial leaps forward possible. So we're talking about a lot of things. Feel free to ask your questions about uh, whatever is on your mind and keep them short and maybe we will get to them. But um, what you were mentioning, Virginia, made me think of a, a recent guest that we had on uh, this webinar space, who was also our honoree uh, at our gala a couple of years ago at the Atlas Society. And that's um, Chip Wilson, and uh, he's the founder of Lululemon, and he oh, yeah. told his story, uh, the story of Lululemon, but it was also clear that it was um, also the story of textiles, mm -hmm. and that uh, you have talked about when we look at, a, you know, a scrap of cloth, that we're actually looking at solutions to innumerable problems, and um I, I think about that with, with Chip as well, that he was seeing that there were problems that the way that the yoga pants were fitting women were not comfortable, you know, that, that their unique biology and the way that their body is formed, that it just wasn't, it wasn't working for them and it was too sheer or it was, uh, you know, stinking. So all of those were problems right, that exactly. he was, you know, what are some other examples of that? Well, uh, well, the, the, there are basic problems of how do you take um, what are in nature very scruffy, not pr terribly promising fibers and turn them into abundant fibers, like the kind of cotton we know today and have known even for you know a couple hundred years is not natural at all. Cotton as it exists in the wild is mostly seeds. Uh, it's not terribly white. Um, it's kind of scraggly, the amount that you get on a plant. And so human beings domesticated cotton, turned it into what one scientist that I quote uh, calls a, a fruit machine, uh, turned these plants. So you start with these very basic problems, which people continue to innovate on today. And the same is true, not just of cotton, but of, of wool and linen, all these so-called natural fibers. There's nothing less natural than silk, by the way. <laughs> uh, that is the, the amount of ingenuity that went into figuring out how to do silk from start to finish is just amazing. And there's a whole separate term for it, which is sericulture, which is like agriculture, but it's about silk. Um, you have all these problems of, you know, how do you make the fiber how do you spin the fiber turn it into something that's long and strong and as you mentioned early on it takes a lot of thread to make anything the denim in a pair of jeans requires six miles of thread and in the pre-industrial revolution world the fastest spinners in the world would have taken about a hundred hours to make that much thread and that doesn't include the time you know, ginning the cotton or preparing it. It doesn't in include the time of weaving or dyeing or anything of that sort. 
You know, how do you make colors color fast? Uh, one of the reason Europeans were so excited when they saw Indian cotton prints uh, in the 17th and 18th century was that Indian dyers had figured out how to dye on cotton, first of all, which is not easy. I've tried it myself. It's very hard to get intense colors on cotton. And secondly, how to make that cotton washable without fading. And that's not an easy thing. That's something that we very much take for granted. And that's something that has improved a lot just in my lifetime, the ability to uh, wash fabrics and have them not fade quickly and uh, even things like wrinkle pre pre prevention. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really just been in the last few decades that that's really worked. Uh, there was this notion of permanent press, if you're old enough to remember that, but but the wrinkle resistant finishes is something that really started conveniently enough around the same time that the idea of business casual started. So all these guys who are wearing their khakis to work, uh, they didn't require a ton of pressing because of these new textile innovations. And then there are a whole bunch of business innovations because from the time you start with the fiber, whether it's polyester or whether it's cotton, to the time somebody gets paid for, uh, say, selling a pair of yoga pants is a long time. And so there are all these periods where people need working capital. And how do you create those financial instruments to allow that to happen? And people have been solving those problems in various ways for thousands of years. So you mentioned that you uh, have tried to, to dye cotton and how difficult that was. Um, I thought one of the most interesting things in the book was uh, you actually learned how to spin. And I didn't realize that there are uh, people that, that do this as a hobby, similarly to people who um, knit or crochet or what have you tell us tell us all about yeah. that, that well that. i wouldn't say that i learned how to spin i would say i learned how to weave i do weave but um i did take a spinning workshop actually i it was in a couple of workshops where i or did spinning spinning is really hard <laughs> because you have to get exactly the right tension too much and it breaks and not enough and you don't get a nice even thin thread. Um, and there's a lot of question about, unlike other stages in textile production, spinning everywhere and always has been mostly done by women or has been done by women. Weaving, it depends on the time, depends on the culture, it even depends on the loom technology. Uh, things like sh herding sheep similarly but spinning is always a female occupation and the question is why and usually people tell these just so stories about well you can spin while you're cooking or you can spin while you're minding children you can spin while you're tending sheep but then why didn't male shepherds do it and i suspect that the reason has to do with very early development of fine motor coordination because it's very hard to spin uh, now it is true that once you get good at it it's sort of it's like magic it's like you're making something out of the air it seems like you're just turning nothing into something and you can see why the ancient greeks and the ancient vikings and i'm sure many other ancient people used it as the sort of analogy to birth or the analogy to creation uh, but i do have friends who spin um and i have a friend uh, who uh, works in it for the ucla library and it's on zoom meetings a lot and spends a lot of those zoom meetings spinning <laughs> while she's listening so once you learn how to do it it's it's kind of an automatic kind of uh, activity, which is a good thing because back when it took so long to make anything, you basically needed to be spinning all the time. Amazing. Well, I guess if I took a couple of workshops um, on spinning, then I could officially be a spinster, not just, yes, exactly. you know, that's where the word comes from. <laughs> a spinster originally meant both an unmarried woman and a woman who spins. And one of the reasons was that spinning was a way that an unmarried woman could make a living. Does my Peloton count? <laughs> you know, so. your Peloton makes it really hard to Google spinning. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, 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 I hadn't thought it went, of that. But it's not as bad as when I was trying to Google glamour because you, <laughs> right. you get a lot of magazine bottles and <laughs> such when you're 
Um, all right, we got a question and I wanna encourage those of you uh, who are joining us to, to, add, to bring your questions, I'll sprinkle them in. Um, Bill McLaughlin, I'm assuming he's with us on Zoom, says to Virginia, uh, I was impressed by your conception of dynamism versus statism um, uh, or stas sta stasism. Yeah. Stasis. I just say dynamism stasis. versus stasis. Okay, stasis. Yeah, right. As an alternative to the classic left-right dichotomy, uh, he's asking if you have applied um, this analysis to the current political climate. I think it is really uh, applicable to the current political climate. Uh, this is not a particularly good time for dynamism. Um, people, uh, whereas when I was writing in the 1990s, it was very much the case that both the left and the right or the, the Republicans and the Democrats had elements of both dynamism and stasis in their coalitions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still today true, I guess, in a literal sense, but in both, the stasis have taken over. And someone once said about the future and its enemies to me, I can't remember who it was, it was like, well, it, it, see, it might seem out of date, but every time you're reading the first chapter, you can just take wherever it says Pat Buchanan, you can say Donald Trump, and you'll get the same result. And, and certainly in terms of a lot of his stated policies, that was the truth, I mean, that he was very much harking back to, uh, uh, you know, if we could have just kept everything the same as it was in 1955, to pick a date, um, where we had big industries, where we didn't have these tech companies, where uh, we didn't have the internationalization of things, uh, less consumer choice, et cetera, what it, pick, pick a thing, that that would be the good life. But unfortunately, it's not like on the other side, you've got people saying, well, therefore we should make uh, it easier to innovate and, and try things. Um, and in fact, right now we're having this huge tech lash, which is very much uh, sort of people being very uncomfortable uh, with uh, that sort of dynamic world in which people are trying things, learning, uh, introducing new ideas, introducing new business models. And there is this kind of constant change which is essentially, if you want to have growth, if you want to have progress, you have to have change. Uh, but human beings, uh, as part of our psychology, at, at a certain rate of change, and it varies with the person, uh, it can be very discomforting. And the other thing is, it can be, even if you like the idea of change and dynamism, and I, I can use myself as an example, um, it can affect your life directly. I mean, I'm a journalist. Uh, when I wrote The Future and Its Enemies in the 1990s, uh, it was much easier for me to make a living than it is today uh, because of, of the effects that things like starting with Craigslist uh, and, and Google and just the sea of what I call the sea of content. Uh, all the prices for journalism have been driven down. The ad models have not worked. Uh, but I would have to say as a, hum you know, as a human being and as a citizen, as a consumer, we are better off. Um, as a journalist, we are worse off. And circling back to the, um, the fabric of civilization, there's an example of this in the book. I mean, we talked some about these spinning machines and the spinning machines changed the world. They made fabric abundant. And that meant, first of all, women didn't have to spend all their lives spinning for very, very low wages because the productivity was so low. Um, some of them could get jobs in spinning mills, which by today's standards were horrible jobs at low wages, but compared to the jobs available previously, they actually paid pretty well. And even more importantly, cloth became abundant. Weavers no longer were sitting around twiddling their thumbs, waiting for enough yarn. Uh, they made good wages uh, by, the, by the standards of the day. Uh, you had cloth not only for clothes more abundant and blankets and curtains and that sort of thing, but also for things like sails and sacks for shipping goods, grains, that sort of thing, tents for armies, I mean, whatever. Uh, Cloth is everywhere. Um, but what's interesting is when those spinning machines came into existence, there was massive 
resistance to them because people were afraid they'd be thrown out of work. And some people were. That was true. I mean, there really was disruption. But the policy was, hey, this is good. You know, this is good for the society. This is good for uh, and new industries will be created. And I actually talk about that some. I have a quote of uh, from that. And what's really interesting is today we when we think about opposition to uh, technology, we sometimes use the word Luddites, which nowadays takes a sort of ideological term. I mean, you think of it as somebody who has an ideological opposition to technology or a cultural aversion to it. Uh, but the original Luddites were hand weavers who were being displaced by power looms in the early 1900s. So they weren't ideologues. They just were guys who didn't want to lose their good paying jobs. I mean, as a human being, it's easy to sympathize. Uh, they were just self-interested and, and they rioted against the machines. They smashed them. Um, the irony is the reason they had those good paying jobs is because the earlier wave of innovation that put other people out of work, which was the spinning machines. And the, uh, the British government's policy at that time was to say, no, you're not allowed to do that. And in fact, some of the Luddites were actually executed. Most of them who were caught rioting, I mean, they weren't executed for their ideas, they were executed for their actions. Uh, most of them were actually deported to Australia. So Australia was uh, some of that, those convicts were actually those sort of loom smashing Luddites. So the history, um, you know, when you, in looking at textile history, a lot of those themes of dynamism come back into focus, less in the political context and more in just the sense that there is this constant churn as ideas, innovations, even ways of, you know, what people like, uh, uh, change, and people who are on top one day are not necessarily on top the next day. And it's not because they're like good people the one day and bad people the next day. It's just because there's this constant search for new ways of doing things, new and better ways of doing things. And, um, if we allow that to go forward, that's where uh, you know, human progress comes from in terms of finding new and better ways of doing things. It's why we are so much richer, uh, even the poorest people than people were 200 years ago. Um, but it is something that very naturally produces resistance. So uh, we have the question, uh, Dennis Watson is, is asking um, about the, uh, the, the Craigslist uh, and the journalism. And I think what uh, Virginia was saying that, that Craigslist was something that uh, drove early adoption. Well, Craigslist destroy classified ads and classified ads were the um, cash cow of newspapers. Um, and that then, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, Craigslist is a great, great thing, um, yeah. but it, it, that completely devastated the, the business of running a, a local newspaper. Um, they continued to have display ads, uh, but then um, when you have when you devastate the department store industry, which was a made because you have Amazon and you also have consolidation there, uh, a lot of those display ads go away. And so even without thinking at all about the fact that people don't necessarily need to be subscribing to get a lot of that news, just on the advertising side, the money goes away. And it's not because newspapers, you know, were bad or something. This is not about like who's good and who's bad. This is about process of finding better ways to do things. And Craigslist was a better idea and it was made possible by new technologies. And Amazon was a better idea. Doesn't mean all brick and mortar retailing is going to disappear because people like to you know, be in social spaces and now we can appreciate it all the more because we're locked in our houses. But, but it was a great thing, uh, but it changed the business model and that changed, I mean, if you destroy local newspapers, which is basically what happened, um, you put 
tens of thousands of, of journalists and other people who work at those newspapers out of work. They have to find other uh, ways of making a living. So, and, and also then the, the advertising models that supported all kinds of publications, not just local newspapers, they're the most dramatic, but, you know, magazines, um, they, they change and therefore then they can't pay as much to their writers. And, uh, you know, I, 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 when I was at Reason Magazine, our uh, business model was ask people who like Reason Magazine to give us more money. And a lot of people who liked Reason Magazine were like, you know, you're for free markets. Why don't you just go make money in the free market, have advertising, whatever, uh, something that they would never apply to. This is my pet peeve, you know, to the Cato Institution. They would, or other think tanks. They, but it was because we had this thing that looked like a commercial. Thing. Well, it turns out Reason's model, business model, was the model of the future. Something I never realized when I left in <laughs> 2000 to pursue more commercial pursuits. Uh, which is nowadays we're in a world where uh, journalism is primarily a matter of patrons and amateurs, either people who have other employment, many of them academics, uh, but. Some of them are in finance, some of them are in marketing, they have other jobs uh, doing it on the side, or people who essentially have patrons because they work for nonprofits. Interesting. Well, Dennis, I'm glad you asked that question because I actually had, had missed, missed the connection that she was talking about. Um, getting back to the book also, we have an interesting question from Vicki, uh, who is doing some research for a book uh, that she is writing on the 1918 Spanish flu. And uh, she is curious about what you know uh, about the fabric used in masks back then. Were they, were they effective? Maybe a little bit more about sort of yeah. the history of, of masks. So I know as, as I know, uh, you know, I did early on in the pandemic, I did a very fun article, uh, which you can find on Bloomberg Opinion. Uh, yeah, we'll put it argue. in the comment stream um, too. Uh, uh, that photo. was an illustr. it was, it was lots of pictures. Uh, it yeah, was sort it was of great. an illustrated timeline of medical masks, starting with the plague doctor masks back in the bubonic oh, plague. And, um, and it did talk a little bit about the Spanish flu mask. And it also talked about sort of how people, when and how people figured out that things like doing surgery with a mask on would be a better idea uh, and how long it took for that to catch on. Um, the masks that were used during the Spanish flu, as far as I can tell, would not have worked very well at all because they were primarily made of gauze, which is a fabric that has holes in it, <laughs> deliberately <laughs> big holes. It actually, I, I learned from my textile research, it actually required, weaving gauze is a special thing. It's, it's, it's it uses a special technique and often special equipment uh, to keep those holes. Uh, so they did layer them, but they would not have been particularly effective. They would have been not as effective as just taking, you know, a couple of well, like, couple of swatches from a sheet or pillowcase and putting them together. Um, but, but people were just figuring out in that period that masking was an effective way of preventing the spread of, of disease. And you really don't see um, surgical masks used in large, you know, at, as a routine matter until around World War I. So it's around that same time. Um, even though there had been some experiments and, and some writing in medical journals earlier, uh, including interestingly by a, a woman who was a doctor in, in Chicago who found that you, know, you were much less likely to spread infection if you were wearing, if the medical personnel were wearing masks. Interesting, all right, well, um... I know this story because you've told me before about how when you were a freshman in college, um, your then future husband, Steve Pastrell, introduced you to Ayn Rand. He liked uh, books a lot. Tell us a little bit about your, your Ayn Rand uh, origin well, story. Well, <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I knew who Ayn Rand was because my parents had read uh, the 
well, read several of her works, but uh, back around the time that Alice Shrugged came out in the early 60s and they had them in the house. But I had never, I had started it once, but never read it. So I met Steve as a freshman and, uh, you know, I, I liked his mind uh, as well as other facts about him. And um, he was a fan of Ayn Rand's. And so I wanted to- Was? I don't like that past tense. Well, I mean, among other things, you know, well, we're talking about 1978. So it's like in 1978, he was a fan. I mean, you know, both of us have, our thinking has evolved from the time we were 18, as everyone's does. Um, But there was something definitely, I, I was interested in the people who influenced him and Rand was not the only one of, you know, at that time, for example, Milton Friedman was very prominent and uh, very spoke very directly to the economic issues of that time. Why do we have stagflation? Um, uh, Some of the questions that interested me just from having grown up being a teenager in the 1970s. Anyway, so I was interested in in Steve and, and how he thought and clearly Rand was an influence on his thoughts. So I read Rand and I liked uh, her work. Uh, I read The Fountainhead first and then Alice Shrugged. And I, I appreciated a, a couple of things in particular. Um, one was, I think a lot of people who read The Fountainhead, and a lot of people do read it who, you know, aren't particularly influenced by it, but they just read it because it's a enjoyable novel and uh, well-known it, it actually gets assigned in high schools and stuff. a lot of the people who read it probably don't really understand the the culture that she portrays that sort of self-abnegating uh, altruism as an ideal culture and I think probably many people feel like that is a straw man Um, But I knew that culture uh, firsthand. Um, And so that idea, and I always sort of, I embraced it, but I also struggled against it. So that, that idea of, you know, your life is important, like, you have to think your life is important because how else, I mean, if other people's lives are important, they have to be important first to them. And similarly, you, I mean, this is a very basic thing that is, is, I don't really think it's a, a, an insight unique to Rand. I think most people just understand it intuitively. Um, it's actually something that um, you almost have to be indoctrinated into thinking anything else. Anyway, so that spoke to me. And then the other thing that I think is the, the real genius of Atlas Shrugged is the understanding that business is a creative pursuit, or it can be. Mm-hmm. And again, the time and place in which I read that uh, is important because in 1978, the idea of entrepreneurship as an ideal was only just beginning in American culture. Uh, since that time, it has exploded. Uh, but we were still at the edge of the the world of um the you know the man in the the gray flannel suit of the uh the corporate ideal of a very you know sort of stereotypical but there's truth to it the 1950s conformity kind of ideal of business and business as anything but a creative pursuit business as something where you know your creativity was being sort of stifled in pursuit of the general corporate uh, objective. So the idea of business as a creative pursuit and that being related to the need for for freedom in that pursuit in the same way you have a need for freedom in artistic pursuits or intellectual pursuits or religious pursuits, all these other things, that really spoke to me. I thought that was very profound. And I continue to think that that is Rand's most important contribution as a writer is seeing that connection as a writer and a cultural figure is seeing that connection. So uh, when you had come out with one of your earlier books, uh, one of my favorites, which is The Power of Glamour, we talk a little bit about 
the glamour of Ayn Rand. And yes. some people don't really see her as a, a, a glamorous figure. Certainly there was a lot of glamour in her books, the skyscrapers, uh, the clothes that she described, the one shoulder with the you know bracelet like a chain and all of that. Um, but uh, you, you talked about that Ayn Rand combined uh, her taste um, and personal style uh, with kind of modernist design ideals. And of course the movie glamor of, of the twenties and thirties. Right, yeah. But she's um, very much a figure who is, sh she was very much shaped by glamor mm -hmm. and also used glamor um, and was in some ways destroyed by glamor uh, personally um, because her, her, she is, you know, she in, when she's still in Russia, she's watching lots of movies and she's absorbing a glamorous idea of America. And she goes to Hollywood and um, she works in movies and she continues to very much embrace the kind of glamor that is, exists in that period in the movies. And, you know, when I talk about glamour and the power of glamour, I talk about glamour as a form of visual persuasion. It is something that we see a glamorous image and it makes us feel if only, if only I could be in that world, if only I could drive that car or be with that person or live in that house, life would be perfect. And Rand is very much shaped in how she want, in how she makes herself by her idea of glamour, her idea of what it means to be a writer, where she wants to live, even what kind of house she wants to live in. Uh, and then she uses glamour also in her work. Um, I mean, she uses the term romance or romantic uh, portrayals. And basically, in my view, romance is glamour with a narrative. So glamour is the still photo and romance is the movie. Uh, and glamour hides the flaws. It hides the disadvantages. It hides the drawbacks. It hides a lot of the effort, the just the, you know, the boring parts. Uh, romance will often show struggle, but in order to overcome it, uh, it, it doesn't show tedium. It doesn't show accounting. <laughs> it shows industry. It shows, you know, it doesn't show the pollution. It shows the smokestacks. It, uh, it doesn't show the, you know, kind of people getting injured on the job. It shows the, the creation that, that it, it comes from that afterwards. And I think that is part of the, I mean, she understood the power of glamour and she was herself shaped by it. And when I say she was kind of destroyed by it was that she wanted to live in that glamorous world. And reality is not the glamorous world. The whole power of glamour is that it obscures certain things about reality. And it can be very powerful and positive in directing our lives. And I think it was in directing her life. And I think her work has been positive in many people's lives uh, because of that glamorous. But in order for it to be truly positive, it has to provide that that push, that direction, but you still have to be able to edit back in and deal with the grubby realities. And some of those grubby realities that she didn't like were, you know, the realities of what she looked like. She was short and she, you know, was, instead of coming to terms with the way somebody might do today, she, she wanted to look a certain way and she couldn't get herself to look like a 1940s or 1930s movie star. That made her crazy. She had glamorous ideas about how relations between men and women would work that were not real, psychologically realistic. Uh, so those, you know, those hurt her, uh, but she clearly both understood glamour and was shaped in positive ways by it. I don't want to overemphasize the negative. It's just part of the story. Well, that's, that's interesting. I sometimes think of uh, um, not just Ayn Rand, but all of us that our, our greatest strengths are also uh, can end up being some of our, our greatest weaknesses. And um, you know, Ayn Rand had this ability to focus. Uh, she had this ability to tune out, you know, the, the, the negativity, the criticism, 
Um, but then I think later in life that became um, a, a lack of openness to the kinds of feedback that you know may have been um, helpful or given her other ideas or let, helped her feel right, less right. Uh, less isolated. Um, the, the other thing is I also think that it was hard. I mean, the uh, the incredibly negative backlash to um, from from critics and and from some quarters and and from conservatives, frankly, let's just face it, uh, to Atlas Shrugged. I think that maybe she um, had underestimated. You know that this this actually uh, you can be as strong as you, you want and have the um, philosophy of objectivism, but. You know, sometimes uh, it, it, it can get to you. Um, and uh, which brings me actually to a question that we've got from somebody on YouTube, which is about uh, socialism and um, communism. And, and Blue Deuce is asking, why are people demanding and protesting for socialism and communism? Do they not understand, you know, the history of how often uh, that, that type of system has, has failed? Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody is, except for the Chinese Communist Party, is really clamoring for communism. And even arguably the Chinese Communist Party is, it's complicated. Um, but socialism has become kind of a glamorous term and it's always had that sort of um, glamor to it. Um, and the flip side of glamor is horror. <laughs> often, often, I mean, the real flip side of glamor is usually boredom or, or you know, tedium or grubby details. But for a lot of people, you know, if, if something that you find glamorous, if I don't like it, I flip it and say, it's the opposite. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the sort of resurgence of the idea or the glamour of socialism comes out of the 2008 uh, financial crisis, where people believed that uh, capitalism failed and that it, it was unfair and that uh, financiers got away with things that ordinary and ordinary people bore the brunt. And we could have, I don't want to get into a long discussion mm -hmm. of the 2008, you know, what was really going on or anything like that. But that was the lived experience of a lot of people was that they felt that their faith in markets and also in government was rocked by that experience. Um, and so then what is the alternative? And then people come along and they say, socialism is the alternative. Well, what do they mean by socialism? Because the problem is socialism has a bunch of different meanings. And I remember uh, back in my senior year, around the time that we graduated, there was this special debate uh, at, at the end of school. Uh, and it was actually on, I forget what the exact resolution was, but it was something like socialism, we should have socialism or it's good or bad. And Steve, who had been a debater in high school, was on the anti-socialism team. And one of the things in that debate... The, the critical point actually was how, who gets to define what we mean by socialism? Because all the people who are on the anti side were saying socialism is the government's ownership of the means of production. Socialism is what they have in Eastern Europe. Uh, socialism is what they had uh, to make a more benign version, you know, when, when Britain was planning its economy in, in a major way after World War II. Socialism makes you poor and takes away your freedom. The other side is saying, no, no, no. Socialism is what they have in Sweden. Socialism is what they have in Germany. Socialism is what would be more accurately called social democracy, which is a large welfare state and a lot of uh, government uh, involvement in the economy, but not government ownership of the means of production and not uh, uh, government, uh, you know, there's a significant role for private enterprise in, in that system. Uh, there's just high taxes. And uh, so, and, and it's compatible with political freedom. So, you know, all these horror stories that you're telling uh, are, are wrong. You know, fast forward a few years later, the Berlin Wall falls and the world comes to an understanding of the limits of planning as well as the limits of communism. It's not just, um, and then we're all riding high because we think, oh, markets triumph. But, you know, it's a pendulum. And I think um, 
I don't think it's helpful when those of us who support free markets or freer markets um, act as if Venezuela and Denmark are the same. They are not. And Denmark does not lead to Venezuela. Uh, Denmark has problems. They are not necessarily problems we want to have. Denmark also has advantages that would not apply to a similar system in the U.S., starting with the fact that Denmark, where I've actually spent a lot of time because there's a big textile research center at the University of Denmark. Uh, Denmark is a tiny, tiny place, <laughs> and it's fairly homogeneous, and they do things like, you know, when you are unemployed and you go on unemployment, uh, I learned this firsthand, you know, you have to get a volunteer job for a nonprofit while you're collecting unemployment. You not only have to look for work, but you actually have to be working. Uh, we don't have anything like that here. And yet that's part of their socialist system. So part of why the, you know, what happens when we make the glamorous picture of socialism in the U.S., where we know we don't have it, uh, is people take everything they like and they say that's socialism and they leave out everything that might be a negative. Uh, so if we have socialized medicine, um, that will mean that everyone gets all the medical care they could need or want for free with no waiting. Well, that's not how it works. Um, and we can have an argument about, you know, what healthcare system is better, but let's have an argument about how they actually work, not about a glamorous vision versus a realistic vision. Well said. Well, uh, this has absolutely, I don't know about for you, this has uh, flown by. I think we have about eight more minutes or so. So uh, so I'd love to to get back to, um, to the book. And I, I'm curious about the cover. What, what, it's a beautiful um, illustration. But tell us a little bit about the thinking behind. Yeah, people. I actually, well, I wasn't privy to it. I mean, they basically said, what do you think of this cover? Mm -hmm. And my only concern was that it might be a little too feminine uh, because this is definitely a book that men like and men uh, uh, get a lot out of. And uh, it's not, you know, it's not a women's book, um, but they convinced me and people love the cover, uh, women and men. Um, and it, it has blur. And so I just went and got blurbs from people like Matt Ridley and Mark Andreessen and, you know, so that you could understand that this isn't much a book about science and technology and entrepreneurship and, uh, and business as it is about cloth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, um, the picture as far as I, I mean, what I think is going on there, because I've looked for the image, is this is uh, a, an Italian Renaissance image um, that has actually been colorized. The original is white, not blue. Um, so the designer changed the color, which I think was really smart and it's a really it's a really beautiful cover and it does get and it's a brocade if you hold it up again um it the this type of patterning that you have in there this is what's called a brocade and this would have required a very complicated very expensive loom and and process in the in that period. So this would have been the most luxurious uh, fabric uh, that you can imagine. And of course, it's got gold on it too. Um, and that is the type of weaving that then gave rise to the jacquard attachment with the punch cards. So that now you can do this with a computer controlled loom very quickly. Uh, you know, it, it, it's easy, it's inexpensive. Uh, Rel relative to you know, what it would have cost uh, in, in earlier times. So uh, we have, I think, a, another question, which is a pretty uh, good one to uh, end with, is um, from Vicki, who asks, I know you're not, you haven't got your, uh, your, your book, uh, your next book. This one just came out, and we are looking forward to seeing the paperback and the audible version of it. But, uh, but what are, were there any, was there things that came up in um, researching and writing this book that are, are maybe have you thinking about, gee, wow, there's a lot more there that I'd like to explore? Well, there is a lot there. Um, 
my immediate interest, uh, because March is International Women's Month <laughs> or Women's History Month, and March 8th is International Women's Day, which is much bigger deal in Europe than it is here. And, and I also had a weird experience in India uh, where our, our hotel, where a couple of us who were taking a workshop uh, was having celebration and they, they wanted these foreign guests to come and like uh, celebrate International Women's Day with, with their uh, female staff. But anyway, uh, so I've been thinking about possibly writing something, just an article about how the history of textiles really reminds us that we need to we need to stop treating women's history as a separate thing that women's history is human history it's part of human history and it's not fair to women or men to try to segregate it and it ratifies the idea that real history is men's history. Uh, so that, you know, if, if, if cave men made stone tools and cave women, we don't know who made it, but made string to tie those tools onto sticks to make spears, the stone tools are the real history and the string we can forget. That's not how history works. And that's not how Stone Age uh, spears worked either. And one thing that comes uh, really to the fore in studying textile history is how all these things are connected. Great. Well, um, everyone, uh, please join me in thanking Virginia for, for taking uh, this time with us uh, in this episode of the Atlas Society Asks. I know she's uh, did two lectures yesterday and it's been kind of round the clock. So, uh, so we really appreciate it, uh, of course. Um, you can go and check out her work uh, on Bloomberg. Um, Virginia, how else can we keep, keep tabs on you? Yeah, so the, the best thing is to just go to my website, which is vpostrel.com, because I keep an archive there. Um, I don't have the medical masks piece uh, because there are issues with the visuals, but I have most of my other articles there. I also have links to all my social media. I have a YouTube channel where I've done a bunch of videos uh, related to textile history, and I'll be doing more over time. Um, I have you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all those things. So if you go to vpostrel.com, you can find pretty much everything. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thanks to all of you who uh, joined us on Zoom, on YouTube, on Facebook. If you uh, like these kinds of webinars, if you like the animated videos, the graphic novels, uh, the living history that we do at the Atlas Society, remember we are, uh, like Reason, uh, a nonprofit. And so please thank you in advance for uh, any consideration of supporting our work. So we will see you all next week. I'm going to be interviewing Tim Sandifer of the Goldwater Institute, uh, who helped us a lot with the, the video that we did. My name is Frederick Douglass. So I will see you all next week. Thanks, Virginia. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Stay well. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.